Hi, I'm Ed Sproing. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at Mentor Graphics with John Ferguson, who's going to talk today about silicon photonics. One of the problems we face as an industry right now, one of the big ones, is power. The power issue comes as a big percentage of the power is because we're taking these electrons and we're pushing them through very difficult, convoluted channels, right? Because if I want to get from point A to point B, I, if I've got something in the way, I have to go up a via, over to another metal, down, up, down, left, right, sideways. I'm making all of these bends. Um, and these are all highly resistive materials. You've got capacitive effects. They're getting slowed down by your parasitics. Um, and so it means you have to push them harder and harder and harder, which means more power. Um, and it becomes expensive. Light, on the other hand, is very different. Because very little affects it, you can send it through and it really just doesn't care. Um, the only things you don't want to do is you don't want to hit a brick wall because it's going to reflect back on itself. Um, so you have to have very gentle curves like we showed in that, that device example. Um, and you kind of really need to know exactly what are you doing with those curved structures to make sure that you're not going to bleed too much out only where you want them to, etc. Um, the other nice thing is one photon can exist in the same space and same time with another photon. Um, they don't even know they're there, right? They're just commingling. It doesn't matter. So you can send potentially all kinds of different signals through the same waveguide at once. Now, this, this is a, a wonderful thing. Um, Google had a, a nice talk at, at one of the conferences I was at last year about how they are looking at that to uh, get better bandwidth as they send a, 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 a optical signals to homes, right? So they can do things like upload movies faster. So you're not competing with your neighbor. You, everyone has a different wavelength. You use the same channel, no problem. It all sounds great. Okay, so how can we further take advantage of, of these things? Well. If you want to induce heat, or if you want to induce a magnetic field, we know how to do that. We do that with electrical devices, right? So if I have that, that same resonator that I had before, that one somewhat similar to it, depending on my drawing. I can do something like put a heater on top of this. And I could have a, a feedback signal, right? Looking at the, the signal coming out of one of the waveguides, feeding back saying, I'm getting what I'm wanting or I'm not. Go heat up this heater or cool down this heater. <clears throat> or we could have a, a PN diode here. Right? Depending on, on where you want to put it, you could to put it up here, so here is my PN junction. And I can use this to induce a magnetic field. Right, so I can do the same thing again. I can say, well, what kind of signal am I getting? I can do a feedback and I can change the um, voltage on, on one side of the PN junction to induce a, a higher or lower electromagnetic field, I'll change the behavior of the optics, and then that will change what's happening in that modulation. So we go from a simple resonator to a modulator. These are probably the simplest, most basic photonic circuits. Um, but it has a lot of promise, right? And that's, that's sort of the exciting part of this. John, where do you see these being used in SOCs? That's a good question. Honestly, I, I don't think we're going to see them in an SOC. I think we're going to see them in 2.5D, 3D designs alongside with SOCs. Where they're communicating between the chips. Yes, yes. So the, the biggest interest in, in most money, I would say, being spent on this today comes from the, the compute farm guys, right? Intel announced something about a week ago. IBM's had several announcements. Oracle's been working on this. These guys are working really hard, and there's a lot of interest from... Amazon, Facebook, 
uh, you know, uh, Google, everyone who's got the cloud infrastructures that needs to support huge rack environments, there's an enormous amount of power being spent just to keep those things cool, if nothing else, right? If we can replace some of that heating, some of that power requirement with photonic capabilities that aren't so hot, that uh, are process so much easier, then there's a huge savings. The problem is we're still a fair ways away from being able to really take advantage of the cost savings that, that we enjoy in the CMOS world. And mostly, at least in my opinion, it's because we're still 20 years behind where we were in electronics as far as building an infrastructure, a design environment. Um, so things like EDA tools and more importantly, EDA integrations, a flow that works from point A to point B to point C all the way through. Um, a lot of the design of silicon photonics seems like analog RF type design, right? It's mostly custom. You're going to draw this stuff by hand because it's very articulate um, and you need to know what you're doing um, and very careful. Um, and so that kind of lends itself to the concepts of doing custom design, right? But there are some key differences. Uh, in the custom design world, you, you start with a schematic um, and you do some simulations. Simulations are all based off of device models. Uh, well, photonics world, we're just now getting to the point where we have compact models for some of these devices. Uh, mostly it's still sort of first principles, TCAD-like, I would say, modeling of the device behavior, which of course does not lend itself to something where you maybe have thousands and thousands of these de devices working together. Um, also, in our world, when we do schematics, we think of the uh, interconnect as ideal. Right? We know metal's not ideal, but the whole principle is I'm going to go from point A to point B, put some metal in there, but just know they're connected for simulation purposes. You can't do that in silicon photonics. And that's again tied to the waveguide. The waveguide um, is very much dependent on the wavelength of the light you're setting in and the signal that you want to do. So you have to be very careful about the width and the length and any curves you have. So if you've got to get from point A to point B and something's in the way, sometimes you can go right through each other. You could put two wave waveguides that cross right across and they're not really going to interfere too badly. Um, but it's kind of a frowned upon practice because it gets confusing. How do I know what's what? Um, so instead you put curves in there and you got to make sure that you curved it just right and you don't have too much loss. So it becomes a much more complex, even more articulate uh, gen generation of layout. I mean, you really have to know what you're doing. Um, and so that changes things a little bit. Um, also another big problem, which seems kind of simple but is not, if we, if we go back to these structures again, when I have I have something like this, and I want to put that in silicon and send it to my foundry. The foundry says, okay, well, here's what you do. You put that in GDS2 form or Oasis form, and then you run DRC on it, and if you're clean, I'll go fix it. Well, there's, there's two problems here. One is GDS doesn't represent curves. Even Oasis doesn't really represent curves. It can represent a circle, um, but not a, a general curve like this. Um, instead, both of these are gridded systems, right? Which means I've got point, point A, point B, point C, right? It's just squares. And all I can say is at, at this point, there is or there isn't, uh, you know, one of these lines here. And so to represent this, it becomes represented as something on a set of lines. And when it goes off, so I don't know if you can see there, but let's say there's some small delta here, right? That, if we blow that up, where there's, here's the dot and here's the red. Now something has to happen. And generally what happens is it's going to get snapped. 
it's going to get moved a little bit. We're going to say that red's not really in nowhere anymore. It's, it's up here. Or I might snap it to one that's down here later. But either way, I don't get a perfect representation of the curve anymore. I get this sort of jaggedy step situation, right? Something like this. All these individual little lines. And so the first question is, well, do they even represent what I wanted in the first place? Am I going to have so much distortion just going into GDS that I'm going to have a problem? The good news is for most cases, the answer is no here. Um, and that's because this width is dependent again on wavelength and it's big. Um, most, most people that are doing silicon photonics are, you can do it at 130 nanometer pretty easily. Some people are doing 90 or 65 just to get better lithographic uh, contrast. Uh, in the processing, but the width stays the same. So one of, you might call it an advantage or a disadvantage, one of the differences is there's no benefit from a shrink in process technology for photonics. Another issue associated with this is, okay, even if I do this and, and these little differences don't make a difference, when I run a DRC deck that the foundry gave me that's written for a CMOS process, I get a problem. If I blow this up a little bit, so let's say I have a little line segment like this, another one like this, another one like this. They're all just a, a few database units wide. Let's say this is on the, the inside. Right, so here's the other side of it. This is going to give me D or C errors. This guy is going to flag as an error to that one because this is too close to that. It's a D or C violation. In the CMOS world, we don't get them because we don't have those funny angles. We omit 90s by default. So a 90 degree bend, we assume you wanted it. If it's 45, we don't, we'll flag it. <clears throat> so the default deck will say that's an error. That's easy enough to fix. You can say, well, don't give me the ones that touch. So, okay, that, that to that is not an error, but guess what? This to this one is now an error, right? And so if I look at this thing, the whole thing lights up like a Christmas tree from a DRC deck. And this, this side will too, because now this is failing internal checks. It's saying this guy is too close on a side to this guy inside the material. The good news, all of that, at least with caliber, we can, we can get around that. It means you need a different deck, but with existing capabilities, you can get around. The other side from a verification aspect is, well, what about LVS? Now, I mentioned that we are starting to get some um, device models. Uh, Mentor in particular, we're working with a couple partner companies. One of them is Lumerical Technologies, um, and they're working in that area, as are some others. We're also working with the company Phoenix uh, out of Europe. Um, and so together, we're working with them in this area. And, one of the things that, that we can do is sort of do this LVS, right? Because now you have a device model. So I've got that ring modulator or resonator that I showed you. It is modeled in some device model and they can run it in their optical simulator. So together with the mentor side, we'll use our ELDO tools. Um, we'll do the simulation of the electronics part. We'll feed back and communicate to them they'll do the uh, simulation of the optics part. Um, and now we just need to make sure that, okay, if we simulated conceptually what we're doing, do I realize this in LVS? Do I realize it in silicon? Am I doing the same thing that I simulated? John Ferguson, thank you very much for a great explanation of silicon photonics. You're welcome. Thank you.